I suppose most men learn their wife is having an affair by arriving home at the wrong time, overhearing an imprudent conversation, or finding physical evidence like soiled panties. My enlightenment was different. My wife sent me an email, actually, and she didn't email me intentionally, although Freudians might say otherwise. My guess is that her email program automatically suggested my name as her intended addressee, and she clicked it without checking. That's certainly easy to do, especially if you're in a hurry. Whatever the case, I was bemused to receive a note from my wife of 18 years entitled, About Yesterday. Since yesterday was a rather ordinary Wednesday, I wondered why Anne would write me an email about it. Opening the message, I found the following. Darling, I just had to tell you again how wonderful yesterday afternoon was. You made me feel things I hadn't felt in years. I can't wait till next week. Your sexy lady. I had been at work all day Wednesday, and as far as I knew, so had Anne. We hadn't even spoken on the phone that afternoon although I did recall her being unusually cheerful when she got home that evening. Furthermore, sexy lady is not one of the terms of endearment I use with Anne. The ugly explanation I leaped to seemed inescapable, and my first thought was to confront her that evening and demand an explanation or, more likely, a confession. But I am a logical and methodical person. It took no great imagination to suppose that she might deny the implications of the errant email, make up some alternative explanation, or simply pass the whole thing off as a joke. What could I say then? Moreover, my fruitless accusation would put her on alert, and any chance I might have of uncovering the truth would almost certainly be lost. After further consideration, I decided to adopt a wait-and-see approach. First, it would be interesting, even amusing, to see if Anne realized her mistake and would initiate an explanation on her own. If not, I had been put on alert and had been given a schedule for her next assignation. That was information I intended to put to good use. Anne sells real estate, so her hours tend to be irregular. This evening, she got home well after I did. I watched her carefully, but found her behavior absolutely normal in every way. If she was aware that she had misaddressed her email, she gave no sign of it. I, in turn, made no hint that anything was amiss. The whole evening was routine, but when we went to bed, I found that sleep would not come. Instead, I lay there wrestling with my problem, looking at it from every angle to see if I could unravel the knot. One possibility, of course, remained that there was a completely innocent explanation. If this were so, I would not only make a fool of myself by acting rashly, but I might even do harm to our marriage. I love my wife, and the last thing I wished was to do something that might drive her away from me. Alternatively, if the email was indeed the smoking gun that revealed an affair in progress, then my marriage was already in jeopardy, in which case I would have to take action. Just because I try to control my emotions doesn't mean I don't have them. As I tossed and turned in my bed, the pain of my wife's possible betrayal ate deep into me. After lengthy consideration, I concluded that my only option was to put the issue aside until I could obtain more definitive information. Fortunately, that's something I'm able to do, and once I reached that conclusion I soon drifted off to sleep. Once I got to work the next morning, I mentally reopened the issue. In the light of a new day, I realized that the coming Wednesday should provide some answers. Accordingly, I contacted a detective agency and made arrangements to have my wife followed. If she did nothing out of the ordinary on Wednesday, that wouldn't absolutely ease my fears, but I would certainly feel better. However, if she engaged in unfaithful behavior, at least I would know the truth and could begin to take appropriate action. Having done all I could do at that point allowed me to set the whole matter aside and go back to my work without distraction. From all outward appearances, the following Wednesday was exactly like any other. Anne and I left for work as usual and returned home late that afternoon at almost identical times. There was nothing about her appearance or behavior that struck me as abnormal or unusual. I sat in the den reading my favorite collection of short stories by Edgar Allan Poe and did my best to conceal any signs of my own unease and suspicions. 
On Thursday morning, I had an appointment with the detective agency to learn the outcome of their surveillance. While I am not a very emotional person, I can still read emotions in others. When I walked into the office, the detective handling my case avoided making eye contact with me. I knew immediately that I would not like what he was about to tell me. It was as bad as I had feared. Early in the afternoon, my wife had left the real estate office where she works, and the detective had followed her to a cut-rate motel near the airport. He handed me pictures showing her meeting a man there and entering a room with him. The timestamp on the photo read 1.52 p.m., approximately two hours later. Another photograph showed the two of them leaving the room together arm in arm. I'm sorry, the detective said to me. We always hate to be the ones to confirm your suspicions. What would you like us to do for you now? I thought about it for a minute. I need your help one more time. It would appear that this motel is the scene of their regular assignations. If that's true, is there any way you could arrange to get photos of what happens inside the room? The detective didn't hesitate. We have a lot of experience obtaining such evidence. There will likely be an additional charge for ensuring the cooperation of the manager of the motel, but if that's acceptable to you, I think we can guarantee satisfaction. I nodded. The cost would be cheap in exchange for the proof. I returned to my office, but this time found to my surprise that I was unable to concentrate on my work. Now that all doubt had been removed, my ability to compartmentalize my thoughts seemed to have vanished. Finally, I gave up trying to work and began to focus on what I had learned. Wiping my eyes, I began to make plans. In addition to the confirmation of my wife's infidelity, I felt I had also discovered why Anne had happened to send the Teltel email to me instead of him. It turned out that I knew her lover. He was our neighbor, Mark Bradshaw. Since my name is Mac Bishop, the email program must have suggested my name after Anne had typed in the first two letters. Very careless of her not to double-check, I thought. But I suppose lust has a way of distracting lovers. Knowing the identity of Anne's lover further increased my sense of betrayal. Mark and his wife, Bobby, were friends of ours. We'd often dined at each other's homes or gone out to movies together, and I'd never noticed any special spark between Anne and Mark. Had I been blind, or had the two of them practiced the art of deception well? Whatever the case, I knew that I had to do something. The question was what? For several hours, I mentally flirted among numerous courses of action. At times, fantasies of revenge played through my mind, only to be followed by scenarios in which I imagined myself pleading with Anne not to leave. Questions about why the affair started and how long it had been going on plagued me. Anger and self-pity danced with one another in my thoughts. Finally, I came to a conclusion. I not only knew what I wanted to accomplish, but I had a pretty well-developed plan for achieving my goals. My campaign would involve two separate courses of action that would take place simultaneously. I thought of them as divide and conquer. Divide the two lovers and conquer her heart again. For the divide part of my plan, I would use my knowledge of Anne, and to a lesser extent, mark to drive a wedge between the two of them. With any luck, I could thwart their relationship until they decided to call it quits on their own. The second part would involve an all-out campaign to win back Anne's affection by becoming the perfect husband. At the same time that I was showing her the downside of her relationship with Mark, I hoped to show her the benefits of resuming her relationship with me. I made extensive notes for myself, listing possible actions for each part of my campaign, planning their timing and working through the interdependencies so that each would complement the other. When I had finished, I saw that the essential element for both was the need to pretend total ignorance of their relationship and to keep them unaware of my knowledge. Obviously, this would require a lot of restraint on my part, but I felt that I could do this. I'm good at not showing emotion. I decided not to initiate my campaign until after the next report from the detective agency, but there were steps I could take in the interim to prepare. First, I purchased a recording system for our home phones, along with a voice-activated recording device which I concealed in Anne's car. Tapping our home phone covered that channel of communication, and while I couldn't tap her cell phone, 
I felt that the car was the most likely place for her to make cell phone calls to Mark. I didn't worry about her calling him from work. The agency had an open plan office, so I reasoned that she wouldn't be likely to hold a conversation with her lover in a place where she could so easily be overheard. My next step was to make changes to Anne's email. Her home computer was already set up to access her work email account. She password protected her system, but I knew where she kept a list of her passwords, and it didn't take me long to gain access. I quickly arranged for a copy of any messages she sent or received to be forwarded automatically to my account. Once I had access to her email, I soon learned that their affair had apparently been going on only a month or so. That suggested they were still in the honeymoon stage of their relationship. My challenge was to engineer an early end to the honeymoon. Having completed the preliminary work, all I had to do was wait until the detective agency produced photographs of their next liaison. In addition to stills, they surprised me by delivering video and audio as well. It wasn't a pleasant surprise. I had steeled myself to see them having sex. What I had not expected were the displays of affection and, dare I say it, love between them. The depth of their intimacy cut deep. It made me wonder if my plan had any real chance to succeed. But I finally decided I had nothing to lose and everything to gain, and so I recommitted myself to the course of action I had planned. My wife is not a patient person, and she doesn't handle disappointment well. I hoped to use that weakness against her to disturb the relationship she had developed with Mark. At the same time, she is very much a romantic, and I felt that might be the path for the other part of my plan. Having a copy of all her emails gave me a decided advantage when it came to planning my program of interference. Their next exchange gave me everything I needed to commence the divide part of my plan. Anne, are we still on for Wednesday? Mark, absolutely. Same time, same place. Can't wait. On the day of their next rendezvous, I took a late lunch and drove over to Anne's office, parking around the corner out of sight. Once she had returned from lunch and gone inside, I casually strolled past her parking lot, took one more look around to be sure the coast was clear, then ducked down beside her car. It took me only a minute to unscrew the valve cap on a tire and let the air out. Then I returned to my car and drove back to my office. Without a membership in AAA and no men in her office, I wondered what she'd do. Sure enough, Twenty minutes before she was supposed to meet Mark at the motel, I got a frantic call from Anne. Mac, I have a flat tire, and I'm supposed to be at a showing in a little while. Can you help me? Don't worry about a thing, babe, I told her reassuringly. Work is pretty light today, so I can fix it for you. I just have to wrap up one thing here, and then I'll be right over. Of course, I waited for another fifteen minutes before leaving which meant I didn't get to her agency until nearly the appointed time for Anne's get-together with Mark. I found her waiting impatiently beside her car. I'm sorry to be so late, babe, I apologized. That took longer than I expected. As she paced back and forth in frustration, I slowly and methodically changed her tire. I had parked my car directly behind hers, so I could load her flat tire in my trunk and take it to get repaired. Of course, that also prevented her from leaving until I was good and ready. By the time I had put on the spare, gotten the flat tire into my car, and had come back from washing my hands, it was well over an hour after the time she was supposed to meet Mark. I apologized to her again for taking so long and told her I hoped this wouldn't affect her relationship with her client. He'll just have to understand, she said resignedly. Sometimes these things happen. While I was changing her tire, I had heard her cell phone go off several times, but although she checked it, she never answered. My guess was that she saw it was Mark calling and didn't want to speak to him in front of me. My suspicion was subsequently confirmed when I got back to my office and saw the anxious email between the two of them. Mark, where are you? I waited at the motel for over an hour. Anne, Mark had a flat tire. Mark. You could have at least called to let me know. I rented a room for nothing. Anne. Mac was here changing the tire. Couldn't talk to you in front of him. Good, I thought. It looks like I've introduced a little tension into their plans. 
That night after dinner, I made a point of ushering Anne to the sofa where I proceeded to place her feet in my lap and give her a foot massage. She looked at me quizzically because she usually has to ask for such treatment. I know you had a frustrating day, babe, and I just wanted to do something nice for you. I told her. She looked at me to see if I was implying anything more, but when I continued to smile and work on her feet, she relaxed onto the sofa. Soon I saw a look of pleasure cross her face, and as I continued massaging her, little groans of pleasure were sweet music to my ears. Not wanting to be too obvious, I waited the rest of the week before my next action. Then on Monday, I had a large floral arrangement delivered to her office with a card that read, To the best wife a man could have. If she felt any twinge of conscience at the irony of my card, she concealed it well. But she did thank me profusely when she got home that night and told me how impressed the other women in the office had been. But what's the occasion? She asked. You never did anything like that before. That's exactly right, sweetheart. I told her, taking her in my arms, and that's something I want to change. What if you'd had that flat tire while you were driving on the highway? That made me think how precious your love is to me, and I wanted to be sure you knew it. She looked at me searchingly, but after a moment's hesitation, she threw her arms around me and hugged me tightly. That's so sweet of you, honey. That really means a lot to me. I couldn't help wondering if she was feeling any guilt. My continuing surveillance of her email again paid off when I learned that the lovers planned to make up for lost time at a special get-together in a few days. I wanted to disrupt their plans, but this time I felt that it might be suspicious if I tampered with her car again. Accordingly, I let her go off to her rendezvous without interference. However, I made it a point to follow, staying well back to avoid being spotted. While she was entering the room Mark had reserved, I pulled around in back of the motel and entered through a side door. The motel was downscale enough that there were no security cameras to record my pulling the fire alarm in the corridor. I had already driven off before the fire department arrived, but I waited down the street long enough to watch the guests being herded to safety out in the parking lot. I didn't spot Anne and Mark, but I knew they had to be in the throng, probably mad as wet hens. Back at the safety of my office, I watched with glee as the emails flew between the two frustrated lovers. Anne, what a cock-up. I'm so mad I could scream. Mark, I'm sorry, but it wasn't my fault. Anne, next time, book some place that's not a fire trap. That's my Anne, I thought to myself. When she got home from work, I could see that she was still seething. But that changed to surprise when she noticed that the dinner table was set with linen napkins and our fine china. And when she smelled her favorite dish simmering on the stove, she looked at me with mock disbelief. Who are you? And what have you done with my husband? She asked with a big smile on her face. It's nothing, I said modestly. I called your office about something this afternoon, and when they told me you had an afternoon meeting with a client that ran late, I figured the last thing you'd want to do would be to come home and cook. I saw a fleeting look of fear pass over her face, but she recovered well and threw her arms around my neck. That is so thoughtful of you, honey, she said. You treat me so well. After dinner, I made a big point of refusing to let her help with the dishes. She gave me a look of gratitude as I ushered her to the den and turned on her favorite TV program. I felt her eyes follow me as I returned to the kitchen, and I decided that the conquer part of my campaign was moving ahead nicely. Whatever reservations Anne might be beginning to have about her affair, the next email I intercepted from Mark made clear that he was not to be deterred by any temporary setbacks. He wanted another taste of my wife's sweet glory hole, and he intended to up the ant to get it. Mark, okay, no more cut-rate motels, sexy lady. This time I've booked a room at the Hyatt. Finally, we can spend some quality time together. Anne, that sounds much better. See you there at the regular time. As I read their email exchange, I cursed Mark's persistence and root his willingness to continue with their interlude. This would call for different measures. I waited until the afternoon of the day before they were to meet, 
then called the Hyatt's reservation desk. This is Mark Bradshaw. I have a reservation for a room for tomorrow, but something came up and I won't be able to make it after all. I'm afraid I'll have to cancel the reservation. No problem, sir, the reservation clerk replied. In fact, we have a big convention booked, and your cancellation will really help us. I smiled in satisfaction. Even though I'd tossed a monkey wrench in the works, I couldn't resist showing up at the Hyatt just to watch what would happen. I found a chair with a view of the reception desk and used a newspaper to hide myself. Sure enough, right on time, the adulterous duo made an appearance, walking hand in hand, chatting and cooing like lovebirds. Their amorous mood didn't last long once they learned they didn't have a room. But I made that reservation days ago, Mark yelled at the hapless clerk. I'm terribly sorry, the poor girl apologized, but according to my screen your reservation was cancelled. That's ridiculous, Mark huffed. Very well, make us another reservation. The girl shook her head sadly. I'm sorry, sir, but the hotel is completely booked up. Unfortunately, with the convention in town, most of the other major hotels are also sold out. You might have some luck at one of the smaller motels near the airport. When Anne heard the last comment, her face turned red and she clenched her fists. As Mark continued to fulminate against the clerk and the hotel, she yanked angrily on his sleeve. Never mind, she said in a loud hiss. Let's get out of here. I'm not in the mood anyway. With that, she turned and stalked off to the parking lot with Mark behind her trying to placate her and tossing out alternatives. It was clear that he wasn't having much luck. I waited until they had both driven away in their cars before leaving my post in the lobby. My work here is done, I thought gleefully. When I got home that night, I stopped her at the door. Don't even bother to come in the house. We're going out. Before she could object, I took her arm and escorted her out to my car. After holding the door for her, I went around to my side and began to drive. What is all this? She asked. Where are we going? I thought you might enjoy a little surprise tonight. I told her with a smile. With that, I turned on the car radio to some soft mood music and proceeded to drive in silence. She watched me curiously, trying to guess what I had in store for her. She became obviously uneasy when she saw me pull into the parking lot of the Hyatt. Why are we coming here? She asked nervously. You'll see. I told her with a wink. Once inside the hotel elevator, I pushed the button for the top floor, and we soon emerged into the Hyatt's rooftop restaurant in their signature rotating dome. When I reached the maitre de station and gave him my name, he checked his reservation list. Ah, there you are. Right on time, he said. With that, he led us to a table on the outer rim where we could look out over the lights of the city. Why did you pick this place? Anne asked suspiciously. No special reason. I told her untruthfully. I just thought it would make a pretty setting for my pretty wife. She smiled tensely at my compliment. But how did you manage to get a table for us? I heard there was a big convention in town. Oh, that was no problem. I said carelessly. I just called today for a reservation. Anne didn't react to my comment, but I knew my success stood in sharp counterpoint to Mark's fiasco this afternoon. Actually, I had made my reservation as soon as I learned of their plans for a rendezvous. I've taken the liberty of ordering for you, I continued. I hope you don't mind. She told me she was grateful for my thoughtfulness and began to relax. She was even more gratified when the waiter brought out an ice bucket holding a bottle of champagne. After we drank several toasts that I made to her, she got really relaxed. When the server brought out oysters on the half shell for the next course, she was delighted. I'm not a big fan of oysters, but Anne loves them. For the main course, the waiter brought out a salmon netwise salad with black olive vinaigrette dressing, and Anne was suitably impressed. I would have guessed you'd order something heavy, like a big steak, she said with a smile. This is perfect. I know you like salads, babe, I told her. Besides, we don't want to get too full. She looked at me inquiringly, but I said nothing more.
For dessert, the waiter brought out two bowls of fresh raspberries with a dollop of whipped cream on top, accompanied by liquor glasses filled with Grand Marnier. It was the perfect ending, and Anne loved it all. As we drove home, she released her seatbelt and snuggled up against me. It appeared that the alcohol and the oysters were having the desired effect. Besides, I felt that she had to be frustrated and longing for intimacy after the failures of her most recent trysts. When we got home, I steered her straight up the stairs to her bedroom. Why don't you slip into your nightgown? I suggested while I attended to other matters. When she turned toward her closet, I darted down the hall to the guest bedroom to make sure everything was ready. When I returned, I was pleased to see that she had chosen a sheer black gown that simultaneously hid and revealed the curves of her body. I led her down the hall to the guest bedroom, which was now glowing with scented candles placed strategically around the turndown bed. As she stood gazing in wonder at my arrangements, I came up behind her and slipped a sleep mask over her eyes. Touch and smell will be the only senses you'll need tonight. I told her as I led her over to the bed and slipped off her gown. Then I stretched her out on the fresh linen sheet. Smell this, I said, waving a bottle of almond-scented oil under her nose. Then I poured a small quantity into my hands to warm it and began to rub it onto her feet. She groaned with pleasure as I gave her an abbreviated foot massage, which further moved up to her entire body and ended with me getting intimate with her. Rousing myself, I pulled the sleep mask off of her face. Her eyes were closed. She had either passed out or collapsed from exhaustion. Taking a deep breath, I picked her up, carried her back to our bedroom, and placed her on our bed. Then I covered her with the sheet, and she quickly dropped off to sleep. I gave myself a quick sponge bath in the sink before returning to the bed. As I fell asleep, I was quite pleased at the way the evening had gone. Normally, Anne and I are on different schedules when we get up for work, but the next morning, she made a special point of rising early. When I went downstairs, I found that she had already made coffee and fixed breakfast for me. When I looked at her, her eyes were sparkling. Thank you, baby. Last night was really something special for me, she told me fervently. I'm so glad you liked it, I replied. I know I'll remember that for a long, long time. She beamed at me. I felt that I was making real progress with Anne. But later that day, I intercepted an email exchange that let me know Mark was still trying to get together with her. Mark, I'm so sorry for what happened at the Hyatt yesterday. I still don't know how they managed to lose my reservation. Anne, I don't know, Mark. Maybe it just wasn't meant to be. Mark, don't say that, sexy lady. Let me make it up to you. Is there any chance you could get away on Saturday? Bobby is going out of town, and we can spend the day at our lake house. No reservation mix-ups, no fire alarms, just some hot loving. Anne, Mac always plays golf on Saturday. I could probably get away while he's on the course. Mark, perfect. I can't wait to get my hands on your hot body again. It was clear to me that my campaign was at a tipping point. I felt that both Divide and Conquer were making inroads, but I needed to do something this weekend, or I stood to lose all the progress I'd made so far. Their new plans posed a real problem for me. Canceling my golf game wouldn't work, and Anne could always pretend to go shopping or find some other excuse to get away. I dared not tamper with her car again. Everything might be lost if she became suspicious of me. Unlike with the motel and hotel, there was no easy way I could play games with Mark's lake house. What I needed was some way to make Anne decide to change her plans, preferably at the last minute. Suddenly, I had a stroke of genius. The perfect solution. Even better, the preparations took only a single phone call. I followed my regular routine for the rest of the week, but on Friday night, I found the opportunity to grab Anne's cell phone and swap out her battery for a dead one I kept. If she tried to call Mark this weekend, I wanted her to use our home phone so I'd get to hear the conversation. Most weekends, Anne and I dress pretty casually. But when I came downstairs Saturday morning, I was interested to note that she had put on an attractive skirt and blouse. 
Oddly, I wondered what type of underwear she might be wearing underneath. As the time grew near for me to leave for the golf course, I noticed Anne watching me somewhat apprehensively, probably because I had made no move to put on my usual golf slacks and shirt. When it was almost time for my regular tea time, and I had made no move to leave, I could almost see the wheels turning in her head as she began preparing an excuse for why she would need to leave the house. Finally, she grew so impatient that she confronted me. Aren't you playing golf today? She demanded. Before I could answer, the doorbell rang. Anne gave me a puzzled look and went to see who was there. When she opened the door, she burst out in astonishment. Miriam, what are you doing here? Is that any way to greet your little sister? Miriam asked as she came through the door. The two women hugged each other excitedly. Of course, I'm glad to see you, Anne bubbled. It's just that I wasn't expecting you. Miriam smiled over at me. I'm here because your wonderful husband invited me. He called me earlier this week to let me know you two didn't have any plans and to suggest that I spend the weekend. It's been so long since we gotten together that I jumped at the chance. Anne and Miriam were extremely close to one another. Scarcely a week went by that they weren't on the phone together. But because Miriam lived a couple of hundred miles away, the two didn't get to visit very often. It's wonderful to have you here, Anne told her. Then she turned to me. That really was a thoughtful thing to do, Mac. Now I know why you gave up your golf game. Well, nothing's more important than giving my wife and her sister a chance to spend some time together, I told them. Now, ladies, I want you to get ready because I'm taking you out to brunch. Then I looked at them again. Actually, Miriam, you may want to change into something dressier than your jeans, but babe, you look perfect just the way you're dressed now. Anne looked down at herself and blushed as she remembered why she had dressed that way. But she recovered nicely. Why don't you help Miriam take her bag up to the guest room? While she's changing, I'm just going to make a quick phone call. I watched her walk down the hall, only to hear muted cursing a minute later. She walked back out holding her unresponsive cell phone. The battery has gone dead, she said angrily. Oh dear, that's too bad. I sympathized. But you can use our home phone, I said, pointing to the wall unit in the kitchen. Never mind, she said hastily. The call wasn't that important anyway. Now, where are we going to brunch? I spent the rest of the weekend doing one activity after another with the two sisters, trying to ensure that they had a great time. I know that when Miriam was preparing to leave Sunday afternoon, she made a special point of giving me a big hug and thanking me. You've got a special one here, she told Anne. Make sure you take good care of him. I thought I saw Anne wince slightly before she smiled and put her arm around me. I will, she promised. I was pretty sure that Anne would find time during the weekend to call Mark, but I wasn't worried. If the call was made on our home phone, I'd have a recording of it. After Anne went to bed Sunday night, I was able to check the recording device. Sure enough, it had captured a call she made to him early Sunday morning. Mark, it's me. Mark, where have you been? You didn't show up on Saturday, and every time I tried to call you, your cell phone went straight to voicemail. I'm so sorry, but I couldn't help it. My sister came into town unexpectedly on Saturday morning, and then my phone battery went dead. I couldn't find a chance to call you in private before now. Couldn't you have gotten away Saturday afternoon? I couldn't, Mark. Mac took us all over town doing things Saturday. Well, what about today? My sister's here for the weekend. I just can't walk out on her. I haven't seen her in months. Well, I felt pretty silly sitting at the lake house with my tool in my hand all day, waiting on you. Don't you ever think about anything except your tool? Fine. I guess I know where I stand in importance to you. Let's not fight about this. Listen, I have to go. I don't want Mac walking in on me. Their conversation delighted me. It sounded like their frustrations were about to boil over, and I felt that I had dealt their relationship the serious blow. I could only hope that it was enough. Eavesdropping on their email on Monday, I found confirmation of my assessment. Mark, 
Are we still going to get together this week? I don't think so. Mark, this whole thing is getting to be too much of a hassle, and it's starting to get to me. Besides, Mac has been really sweet to me lately, and I'm feeling pretty guilty about running around behind his back. I think we need to end this now. Don't say that. At least one more time. No, I mean it. It's over. Well, I can't say I'm not disappointed. You're still one sexy lady, but I understand what you're saying. Maybe it's for the best. I don't want to lose Bobby either, but I hope we can still be friends. Sure, we'll stay friends. Just not friends with benefits. Success. I had managed to insert enough problems into their relationship to cause it to collapse, just as I'd hoped. Now the only thing left for me was to complete the second half of my plan. When I got home that evening, Anne was moody and distracted. Once or twice, I even thought I saw tears in her eyes. I didn't want to intrude, but I felt I shouldn't ignore her behavior entirely. Are you okay, babe? I asked solicitously. You seem to be sort of down tonight. Did you have a problem at work? Oh, it's nothing, she said, not looking at me. I guess I'm just in a blue mood. It's probably hormones or something like that. I nodded and gave her some space for the rest of the evening. But inwardly, I was gloating because I was certain she was mourning the end of her relationship with Mark. Even though it had been her decision to halt the affair, I knew that Anne invests a lot of emotions in any relationship and can't let one go without some sense of loss. I actually found her mood reassuring. She wouldn't have felt so blue if she hadn't decided to end things. But I couldn't help thinking that Mark was unlikely to have a similar reaction. He's probably with Bobby this very moment, I thought snidely. The next morning, Anne was in a much better emotional state. During the day, I saw no further emails between Mark and her, which reinforced my belief that neither was having second thoughts. That gave me a growing sense of triumph. Everything was turning out as I had planned. That evening after dinner, I again had my Edgar Allan Poe book in my lap when Anne came in the den. Which one are you reading this time? She asked. One of my favorites, I told her. The Cask of Amontillado. I don't know that one, she said. Then she snuggled up beside me. Can I interrupt you for a minute? I just wanted you to know what a wonderful husband you are to me, she said earnestly gazing into my eyes. The last few weeks you've been so sweet to me, and I feel really lucky to have you. My heart soared at those words, and I knew that I had won. This was the moment I had waited for. I returned her gaze but said nothing, waiting to see what else she might say. She paused, and for just a moment, I saw an expression that might have been guilt pass over her face. Her eyes seemed to water a bit. I really don't deserve you she said fervently. No, I said calmly. I don't deserve you. Then I reached over to the desk drawer. And I certainly didn't deserve this, I said harshly, plopping into her lap the still photos of her session with Mark at the motel. At first, she looked at me in confusion because of the change in my tone of voice, and then she had trouble comprehending what I had given her. But when she focused on the stills and recognized what they depicted, she began to wail. Oh my God. No, no. I reached back again and handed her a copy of the divorce petition that my attorney had filed earlier in the day. When she realized what I had given her, she gasped. But I thought you and I, I mean, isn't there some way? Coldly, I interrupted her, handing her another set of papers. And in case you're wondering about Mark, Here's a copy of the email I sent to Bobby this evening with a copy of the detective's report attached. Underneath that, you'll find a similar email I sent to your sister Miriam, explaining why I'm divorcing you. She moaned in anguish and began to sob again. I just don't understand. You were so loving and caring all these weeks. I can't believe you'd do such a cruel thing now. Didn't all that mean anything? My dear, I said evenly. When you embarked on your sordid little affair, you ended all the love I felt for you. So I've spent the last few weeks working to end your relationship with Mark. As for the way I treated you, well, I wanted to make sure you'd know how much you'd lost when you betrayed me. 
My goal was to take away from you the same things you'd taken from me. And as best I can tell, my plan has worked perfectly. Anne collapsed on the sofa, sobbing piteously. Before I walked away, I reached over and set the book of Poe's short stories I'd been reading on top of the other documents I'd given her. The text was still open to the cask of the Montilado, and I'd used a highlighter to mark the passage containing the Montresor family motto for her to see. No one dishonors me with impunity. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.